Okay, well, good evening. Great to have everyone here tonight. My name is Brian Etling. As, as I just mentioned, I've been working 24 years in the national parks. This is me taken at Cradle Lake National Park. I also, and that's in Oregon, and I also worked in Everglades National Park in South Florida. So I've been involved with Citizens Climate Lobby for four years now. And on the first call I was on in April 2012, I'll never forget there was this person that called in Ellie Sparks, and she talked about how engaging our member of Congress should be like an arranged marriage or kind of like a romantic courtship because you're trying to find what you have in common with them. You know, if you're dating someone, you know, do you like karate? Do you like Italian food? That kind of thing. And it's the same kind of thing with our member of Congress. What do we have in common with them? So building up that relationship. And so I've always kept that in the back of my mind. So then what happened was that in November of 2015, I went to the November Lobby Day. And that morning, I had a meeting with Hillary Pingar, who's the, the, the legislative aide for U.S. Senator Roy Blunt. And it's my very first time lobbying a congressional office in D.C. So, of course, I'm very nervous. And in a sense, I don't know what to say, but I'm keeping Ellie's advice in the back of my head. And so I asked Hillary, I said, what do you like to do in your spare time? I just kind of blurted out. And she kind of started laughing because <laughs> congressional aides don't really have spare time. They, you know, they work like 70 hours a week. They're on the go all the time. And plus, she let it be known that, that she's married, plus I'm married. So it was kind of an embarrassing question. So, but after she was finished laughing, which I, I thought started a good rapport right there, she said her and her husband like to travel to national parks. Well, I lit up immediately, and it just so happened I had a picture of me taken at Crater Lake National Park 24 years ago. I haven't changed a bit, have I, if you're seeing me on screen there? And so I showed Hillary this picture. I said, I, I've been working in the National Parks, Crater Lake National Park in Oregon, and also Everglades National Park in Florida. And in my spare time in the Everglades, I like, I like canoeing up and, and seeing the wild flamingos and also the alligators and crocodiles. But park visitors expect park range to know everything. So they started asking about this global warming thing. And so I quickly read that with sea level rise, by the end of the century, there could be a three foot sea level rise. And that, that would actually inundate, swallow up most of Everglades National Park and the flamingos, alligators, and crocodiles would lose this, one, lose this wonderful habitat. And so I became very worried about climate change. And, and that would also impact millions of people living in South Florida. Millions of people would lose, lose their homes and businesses. Crater Lake National Park, our snowpack has been going down over the years, which I'll cover here in a moment. As our snowpack is going down, our, our, our winters are getting shorter and less snowy and warmer. So what does that do to our fire season? That makes our fire season longer, hotter, and more intense. So if you're, if you're looking at this visually, you'll see two pictures here. The one on the left is what you normally see coming into Crater Lake National Park, our park entrance sign, reading if you're coming in from the north. The one on the right was from our largest forest fire in our park's history in August of 2015. The winter before, we had had our lowest snowpack on record. Record. So our trees were just extra dry, so we had a 20,000 acre fire. And so the picture on the right actually went viral. And when that picture went viral, that means people start canceling their vacation plans because people don't want to drive through smoke and flames. And when people cancel their vacations, that has a huge impact on local businesses. And when local impacts in businesses are impact, that does reach members of Congress. And so my elevator speech to basically to Hillary was, is that I've seen, I've, I've been working in the national parks and I've seen the impacts of climate change. And that's why I was in her office that day. So the National Park Service. So the, the question was asked, is there a national park by in, in your district? And I, and I believe a lot of people said no, but keep in mind the nas national parks, that term, is used differently than those of us who work for the National Park Service. There's actually, in the National Park Service, there's different designations. A national park is actually dedicated by Congress. That's set aside by Congress, where a monument is actually set aside by the President of the United States. The first one was by Theodore Roosevelt in 1906. And some of our national parks actually start out as national monuments, such as Grand Canyon and Death Valley. 
But the National Park Service, we also run battlefields, seashores, historical homes. The White House itself is a National Park Service site, as well as the Statue of Liberty, Everglades where I worked. So you name it. And there's about 413, we call them units, within the National Park Service system. And they cover 84 million acres, and they're basically in every state. The most recent one to get one was Delaware, but they're, they're all throughout the District of Columbia, American Samoa, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. And if you see the globe in the top right corner of my picture, the National Park Service units basically go from the Virgin Islands to Guam. So you can almost argue that the sun almost doesn't set on the National Park Service system. So where I'm from in St. Louis, I'm about a half an hour drive from the Gateway Arch. And the Gateway Arch and the grounds around it are known as is the Jefferson Memorial Expansion, the uh, Jefferson Expansion M Memorial. And that site alone gets close to a million visitors each year. And that's big for the St. Louis economy. And so when I'm meeting with U.S. Senator Claire McCaskill, these National Park Service unions are important, whether they're in her home state of Missouri. But keep in mind, where do U.S. Senators and representatives go when they go on vacation or on business trips? They love to visit other national parks and monuments. For instance, Vicki Hartzler from Missouri visited Crater Lake this summer. So we get other members of Congress visiting Crater Lake and other national parks because they want to see what's happening in our national parks. So they are a big deal, even if they're not in their home state. And national parks, in the national park system, they're a big contributor to the U.S. economy, close to $17 billion each year. And if you look at the circle, the one part in red, that's a big part, probably close to a third of it is hotels inside and nearby, and nearby communities of our national parks. Gasoline is a, big, is a big contributor, people buying gas, as well as groceries to camp, restaurants. You add this up, you know, souvenirs, recreational spending, that's $17 billion. Now, when we think of going to Europe, a lot of us think of going to the castles and the and historic churches. When Europeans and other, other people across the world are coming to the U.S., they're thinking about coming to our national parks. So they're a big part of our tourist economy in this country. As far as impacts to local economies, I don't know how, how well you'll see this at home, but the top 10 visitors parked by spending, the number one is Blue Ridge Parkway, which I believe runs from Virginia to like Alabama. And I just looked at that figure. Blue Ridge Parkway itself, as far as the nearby local economy, contributes up to close to a billion dollars itself. Great Smoky Mountains for North Carolina and Tennessee and surrounding area contributes up to $800 million. Grand Canyon, if I, if I can put in a side note about this, I had connections to hike to the bottom in 2010 and stay at a special VIP cabin. And I was told by my park ranger friends, you will leave this cabin spotless because not only does the superintendent stay down there when she can, but US Senator John McCain likes to st stay in this cabin. So, also on this list, as far as top 10 parks by visitor spending, is Denali, Grand Teton, Yellowstone, Yosemite, Golden Gate by San Francisco, Lake Mead by Las Vegas, Olympic, which is just right, right by Seattle. So Crater Lake, this is the one I'm most familiar with in Southern Oregon. Crater Lake itself cont contributes about $52 million to the Oregon, and, I, and, and you could say, argue the, the U.S. economy. The, the biggest part of it is the hotels, you know, inside and outside of the park. But then another big, big part of this is, is restaurants, as well as camping, gasoline, groceries. And if I can mention this, as far as Crater Lake, our road going through the park, if you want to drive from the north entrance to the south entrance, that's only really open from about the third week of June to late October. We have to plow that road starting in April to get that road ready for the summer. Now, if we get less snow, that road can open up Memorial Weekend, which has happened a few times during the last few years. But when we get a heavy, heavy snow, and we're getting a lot of snow this, this winter out west, that road may not open until like the third week of June. Now, when that road get, gets delayed because of heavy snow, what happens is that not as many people come to visit us because they're waiting for the roads to open up fully going through the park. And so when people are delaying their vacation or not coming there, 
that means people aren't staying in local hotels. And when people aren't staying in local hotels, what the, what the nearby businesses end up doing, they end, end up, they do call their members of Congress. And so my park superintendent has personally told me that yeah. when we're delayed getting the road open, he actually hears from the U.S. Senators from Oregon and a representative there too. So the, our, our members of Congress are very in tune to what's happening in, in our local national parks. So national parks, and I really do encourage each of you to visit them too. They're just so inspiring to visit, to get that sense of re rejuvenation and to rediscover why are we working on climate change. If you go to a group start, a, a Citizens Climate Lobby group start, you will often hear this quote by E.B. White, the author of Stuart Little and also Charlotte's Web, that every morning I awake torn between a desire to save the world and an inclination to savor it. It makes it hard to plan the day. But if we forget to savor the world, what possibly reason do we have for saving it? In a way, savoring must come first. So I encourage you to visit our national parks. And this is a picture of the Lower Falls at Yellowstone National Park in the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. But you don't oftentimes have to go that far to visit an, a site within the National Park Service system. For instance, Cuyahoga Valley National Park. This is only a down, this is only about a half an hour drive from downtown Cleveland, Ohio. So this is located on the suburbs, the southwest suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio. Crater Lake National Park, this is the one I'm most familiar with. So I wanted to share some time talking about what's happening there with climate change. Well, Crater Lake is one of the cleanest and purest bodies of water in the world. We're also the deepest lake in the United States, almost 2,000 feet deep. But Crater Lake, that water is so pure there that I actually stop the boat tour. I narrate the boat tours in the summertime and I scoop up my analogy bottle and I drink the water from the passengers. That's how clean that water is. And it gives this amazing blue because it's basically re reflecting the blue part of the sun ray. So people are just amazed seeing that blue color. So what's happening with Crater Lake, what concerns us is over the past 30 years, since about 1980, scientists have noticed that the summertime air temperature has gone about four degrees Celsius, and that's about seven degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the first foot of the lake has gone up about four degrees Celsius, about seven degrees centigrade. And we're concerned about warming temperatures on the lake because for years, scientists have been worried well, if we get warming temperatures, that could spur algae growth. And if we get algae growth, that could reduce the clarity at Crater Lake. Now, for years, that was always kind of theory. But last November, in, you know, in, it, as far as reducing our water clarity, but last November, I got this notice from the park that they actually did get a small algae bloom in a corner of the lake. Now, we don't know if that's directly related to climate change or not yet. I mean, this is just new information here. But that really worries me. That could be a sign of possibly climate change impacting the lake. The American pika, if you ever seen a picture of a pika, pika boar, absolutely gorgeous animal. They will just absolutely steal your heart. Their nickname is the rock rabbit or boulder bunny. They live high up in the mountains. They have an internal body temperature about 104.2 degrees. Think about that. If you get above 102, you're thinking about checking into a hospital. But these guys live with a with a body temperature about 104 degrees, and that's because they live high up in the mountains, anywhere from 8,000 feet to 1,300 feet. And so what happens at, with warming temperatures out west, and pikas are also found in you know, Yellowstone and Grand Tetons, Rocky Mountain, Craters of the Moon, et, et cetera, what happens is that with warming temperatures, these pikas have had to move uphill, and in some cases, it's literally pushed them on top of mountaintops because the mountain high ele elevation is not high enough for them to live. And so when they get pushed off these mountains, scientists actually refer to that as going to heaven. And so we're worried about losing pikas out west, west with warming temperatures. Now I mentioned snowpack before at Crater Lake. And here's a picture of a ranger standing in front of a huge pack of snow. We get an average about 43 feet of snow a year, about 520 inches. Now that's averaged out over many years and decades. 
when we break it down by a decade, this is what we notice. We notice in the 1930s, we had about 614 inches of snow. It went up to in the 1940s, about 623 inches, but it's been going down by decades since then. And this decade has been very alarming. 2013, we had 354 inches of snow. 2014, 257 inches of snow. We had mandatory water meetings in, in our park that summer. We were told by our park superintendent, you will not be washing your cars this summer. We want you taking shorter showers, <laughs> you know, using less water. And the park was very concerned because with less water, we were trying to figure out our water rights with the, in conjunction with the nearby Native American tribes and also the farmers in the cities with, as far as our water rights in the park. That's how, how low the water was getting there. Well, the next year, we didn't even break 200 inches of snow. And I was really shocked when I drove in the park how little snow. There was normally, when I show up around May 1st, about seven to eight feet of snow. There was only about three to four feet of snow. Now, what does that mean, snowpack out west? Well, Crater Lake is actually the beginning of the watershed for three water, for three water basins, kind of three watersheds in Southern Oregon. There's the Klamath, the Rogue, and the Umpqua. And if you follow the news in Southern Oregon for the last couple of decades, what's been happening is that there, we're getting less snow in the Cascades. That's the mountain range surrounding Crater Lake. And as we get less snow, what's happening, there's been nasty fights between the cattle ranchers, the salmon fishermen, the cities, and the Native American tribes over this diminishing water pie. So, Less snowpack in the mountains, whether it's the Sierra Nevadas, the, the Rockies, or the Cascades, has a big impact on the cities. And, and we're definitely seeing that up close in Crater Lake in our national parks. What about other national parks? Well, Crater Lake is about a four-hour drive from Redwood National Park in Northern California. Redwoods get up to 40% of their moisture from fog coming off the Pacific Ocean. And scientists are worried with warming temperatures, there could be less fog. And so that could have a negative impact on redwood trees, as well as more severe rain and more, more severe weather on the trees. Yosemite National Park. When we think of Yosemite, we think, we think of the iconic Yosemite waterfalls, which is about, falls about 2,000 feet above the valley floor. When I first went to Yosemite in October of 1996, I couldn't find the falls because I learned during my visit that Yosemite Falls is actually seasonal. It stops running sometime in August. Well, Yosemite Falls is 100% snowpack. And if the Sierra Nevadas get less snowpack, that means that Yosemite Falls could stop running earlier and earlier, which means less people on vacation would have a chance to visit, see the beauty of Yosemite Falls itself. Grand Canyon National Park. I was actually invited to be a guest speaker at Grand Canyon National Park in May of 2013. And so I had an audience of about 200 people at the Shrine of the Ages Auditorium. And so to do a climate change talk of the Grand Canyon, of course, Grand Canyon would need to include information on the park itself. So within a period of 24 hours, it felt like I had to cram for a final exam for 200 people. And so what the, the scientists at Grand Can Canyon wanted me to share was the impact on their trees in their wildlife, particularly the, the gamble oak, and especially with what's called phenology. And phenology is the study of how seasonal life cycle events for plants and animals are impact, impacted by variations in climate. And so what's going on is that the, this is happening with the English oak, oak in Europe and the gamble oak in North America. They're, the leaves are budding earlier in the spring. And so when the leaves start budding, the winter moths come out and the winter moss starts feeding on the leaves. But when they get enough food in them, they go into their cocoon stage, become butterflies. Well, if they go in that cocoon stage too early, all of a sudden the pied pie captures and other birds show up and they have no food source. And so what's happened is that for the pied pie cap catcher, they've had an up to 90% decline. So scientists are very worried about climate change disrupting this life cycle for the plants and animals. Joshua Tree National Park, only about an hour west of Los Angeles. Scientists are very worried they could lose their iconic Joshua trees because of warming temperatures in the next 50 years. Grand Canyon, or I'm sorry, Glacier National Park in Montana. On the left, I have a picture of the Grinnell Glacier in 1913. On the right is the Grinnell 
glacier in 2,300 years later. It's, this glacier has almost disappeared. The National Park Service and NASA are very worried that they could lose all the glaciers in Glacier National Park, which is just with a few years because of climate change. And I want to mention my friend Larry Lazar. Larry Lazar here in St. Louis. We actually started the Climate Reality St. Louis Meetup Group. And it's from this group that I, I became involved with Citizens Climate Lobby. Larry is interesting because this might be an interesting story for your friends and family. Larry, 20 years ago, did not accept the science of climate change. But he went to visit his sister and brother-in-law in Alaska. And all of us, when we have friends and family, where do we take them? We take them to our nearby national parks and monuments. And so Larry's at Glacier Bay National Park, and he's trying to see the Portage Glacier, and he can't see it anymore. And he's, he's wondering, aren't, aren't, aren't I supposed to see a glacier at this area? Well, Larry then saw this wayside sign that said, scientists at NOAA and NASA say glaciers are melting because there's more heat trapping carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The inhuman activities are the cause. And this shocked Larry because his, his sources of news were not telling him about this, about climate change, but he went home and started reading himself. And that's how he, became, yeah, that's how he accepted the science of climate change. And so the National Park Service itself, there's actually a website, it's actually listed at the bottom. National Park Service, if you, if you Google National Park Service and climate change, they have their own website and they say there's four key messages. Human activities, number one is human activities are changing the Earth's climate. Number two, climate change affects national parks and the treasures they protect. Number three, the National Park Service is addressing climate change. And number four, the choices you make today make a difference. So this is what our present director, John Jarvis, says about climate change. He says, quote, I believe climate change is fundamentally the greatest threat to the integrity of our national parks that we've ever experienced. The current science confirms that the planet is warming and the effects are here and now. This is a high priority for the current administration, the Department of Interior, and the National Park Service. Now, somebody probably asked me, well, will this philosophy change under the Trump administration? And my short answer is no. It's basically in our DNA to, to cover the American history unvarnished and to give folks basically the unvarnished truth about nature and the outdoors and science. John Jarvis went on to say this. The National Park Service helped the understanding of the essential role of predators in the environment by bringing back the wolf in Yellowstone. We have shown that fire is essential for ecosystem health. We're unafraid to discuss the role of slavery in the Civil War or the imprisonment of American citizens of Japanese essence, ethnicity during World War II. We should not be afraid to talk about climate change. So we don't know what's going to happen with the Trump administration. They may decide that the National Park Service cannot talk about climate change. But if, even if they do that, what's going to happen is that we've been talking the genies out of the bottle. We've been, talking about, we've been talking about climate change for years. So, for instance, if you'd show up at Mount Vernon, and if you asked a park ranger, did George Washington have slaves? And are, are there slave quarters here? If the park ranger told you, well, it's too controversial to talk about that, I know you'd probably feel livid, uh, very upset. And it's the same thing about climate change. People have been hearing us talk about climate change now for years. And if we decide all of a sudden that we can't talk about it, or if we're being pressured not to talk about it, I don't think the general public's gonna accept that at all. So the National Park Service is addressing climate change. And I can pause here for a moment before I talk about solutions to see if anybody has any questions. Ricky, do you, do you wanna pause for questions? Should we pause for, for questions right now? Um, yeah, well, how much longer do you have with the Park Service? Hey, just a few minutes, more minutes, maybe like five more minutes to go talk about solutions. Yeah, let's go ahead and do the, go ahead and finish up. And we got a couple of questions. In okay. We'll so, so speaking of, of solutions, I, it, and I can talk about Crater Lake, and I'm going to focus on Crater Lake and also Grand Canyon. So one of the things we have Crater Lake since 2010, we've got trolley tours. And the trolley tours run on compressed natural gas. And they give up up to 90% less carbon than a large RV going through the park. Plus, it's a way, it holds 23 people. It's a way to have less cars on our roads. And plus, you get outstanding narrations from a park ranger. Hint. Hybrid vehicles. We try to get as many hybrid vehicles as we can at Cradle Lake from the Government Services Administration, GSA. This is one of my favorite cars to drive. It's called the Ford Fusion. 
We've had it since about 2010. It has a lot of bells and whistles on it. It's fun to car to drive, gets great gas mileage. And because of all the bells and whistles, one of my colleagues calls it the Ford Confusion. Our north entrance station at Cradle Lake National Park has run 100% on solar power for decades. And now if you can afford to drive a Tesla, I know they're, they're out of a par price range for many people, there's now Tesla, Tesla charging stations at Cradle Lake and many national parks out west. So when you're shopping in the gift store or, 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 or eating dinner in the restaurant, you can charge your Tesla and other electric vehicles in with the comfort of knowing your, your car is, is going to have more electricity in it when you, when you go back out to your car. So what about Grand Canyon National Park? So since I was at Grand Canyon, I, I got to learn about what, what, how are they reducing the impact of climate change. Now, Grand Canyon National Park and other large national parks, they're what's called the climate-friendly parks. That's where national parks are exchanging ideas on how to reduce their carbon footprint. And also implementing policies such as more renewable energy. So the Grand Canyon South Visitor Center, that's almost run 100%, almost 100% on solar power. They use reclaimed water there. So when they have a rainstorm, they've got big cisterns to collect water, and that's how they water their plants outside of the visitor center. Sustainable design, their maintenance buildings, and also their science research facilities. Or basically, their new buildings are all LEED certified, using as little electricity and wasting as, wasting as little heat and, and air conditioning as possible. And also, they have an outstanding shuttle bus system at the south rim of the Grand Canyon, as well as Yosemite National Park there too. So it's great because I've gotten lost into the south rim of the Grand, Grand Canyon as well as Yosemite. So it's wonderful for me to just be able to park in one spot and use a, a shuttle bus to get to the trailheads and different hotels or, or, or campgrounds in, in, in those areas. Grand Canyon also has plenty of bikes to rent. So they do rent bikes and, and I know in Yosemite Valley, Grand Canyon and other parks too. And also, and again, Grand Canyon tries to use as, use as many hybrid vehicles or electric vehicles as they can. So now, if I meet with a, a legislative aide, a congressional aide like Hillary, and I did get to see her again last November, she's an aide to a different member of Congress, I can actually say to her, hey, Hillary, how is, how is visiting those national parks going with your husband? Which ones have you visited to lately? And by the way, I'm still working in national parks. We're still seeing the impact of climate change but we're trying to be part of the solution and hopefully we can work together also to be part, part of a solution also on climate change.